Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll spend three happened. minutes after. Yeah, we'll just ro we'll just roll with it. You know. Yeah, exactly. Live theater. Uh, okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, I'm sure some other people will be strolling in at the end. My name is Chris. I'm the founder and president of So Quiet. Thank you so much for being here. I've got a little bit of housekeeping to go over. So I'm gonna go and get it started and then I'll introduce our guests and presenters today. Uh, let me go ahead and share my presentation. So can everybody see that all right? All right. This is the So Quiet Science Session. This is our second one. I'm going to try to use not as many S sounds. Uh, unfortunately, that's the name of the event. A um, couple of things to go over as far as, I wouldn't call them rules, but just guidelines. Please, if you are on this call, if you don't mind, uh, if you're not myself or one of the presenters, keep your camera off. If you can turn your camera off and your mic on mute, unless you come on and talk later on, which could happen. It's not that we don't want to see your lovely faces. It's mainly to reduce unintentional activators, visual activators that can happen uh, and to make the event more accessible. So we've all been on Zoom meetings and there's one person who's not even talking, who's doing something that's distracting us. So we're just going to try to minimize that. But we're all glad you're here. Uh, please put questions in chat. There's a chat box. I will be monitoring that as well, uh, our guests. So if you have any questions you would like for the Q&A towards the end of this event, Go ahead and put those in chat. I'll try to monitor as best as I can. Also, feel free to use the closed captioning. We're on Google Meet, which has a cool feature. Uh, underneath your screen, at the bottom of your screen in your browser, there should be a little box with a CC. That's for closed captioning. You can turn that on for yourself if, if the sounds are bothering you. And you can read what we're saying in real time. So that's a handy uh, feature as well. Please let me know in chat, or if it's really driving you crazy, you can come on uh, and and let me know if there's anything that myself or any of our guests are doing that are activators for you. I sometimes talk with my hands, those kinds of things. Let me know. Uh, and lastly, this event is being recorded, so you're being recorded, and we'll be posting the video from this meeting uh, or this event on YouTube and our our website in the next couple of days. And that is by and large the housekeeping part of it. A few other things to go over. Let me scroll through here. Uh, if you're not familiar with our organization, uh, we're a brand new, well, brand new. We've been uh, around about a year. Uh, nonprofit or non-government organization located in the United States, specifically for misophonia and related disorders, conditions, um, as far as research, support, advocacy. Some of the things we've launched this year are student research grants, which we offer research grants to graduate students who are researching misophonia. That's been a lot of fun to advance future research uh, at the starting gate of people who are in grad school and want to research misophonia. We also have the misophonia research pool, which is a centralized list where you can sign up to be informed of and be included in misophonia research in the future. Or if you're a researcher, you're welcome to take advantage of the pool and the people who have signed up there to participate in your studies. And lastly, uh, one more thing that we are doing as far as misophonia research is these science sessions. We know there's kind of a gap between academia and the research going on, which is very important. There's been a lot of it happening even in just this year. And the general misosphere, the general public, sometimes there's a little bit of a disconnect between all the things we're finding out and testing and studying on the research end and the general public. As well, sometimes there are things that are speculation that aren't necessarily known to be true or false, they get passed around uh, as fact regarding misophonia. And we want to clarify some of the things that we do know and things we don't know about misophonia currently. Our programs are free, free of course, thanks to your tax deductible donations, if you'd like to donate. Uh, and some of you have already done that. We're appreciative of both you being here and for donating. You can also text the word so quiet to 53555 to donate via text. And lastly, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns after this, feel free to contact me at hello at soquiet.org. If you have ideas, if there's something that you thought really needed to be brought to our attention, please do so. And with that being said, I will stop presenting and let our guests introduce themselves. If you don't mind, go ahead. Jean? Who's going first? Me? Jane. I don't know. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Jane Gregory. Um, I have misophonia myself, so this uh, working with misophonia is very much a passion project of mine. I'm a clinical psychologist by background, 
and am now doing research on misophonia at the University of Oxford in uh, the UK, which is where I'm calling you from today. Um, and so my, my work is really trying to look at the overlap, uh, sort of the um, cycle between therapy and research and how we can help people with misophonia to live more functional lives and what are the parts of misophonia that might be able to change with the help of therapy and what are the parts that actually we just have to figure out how we need to learn to live with those parts. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, hi guys, I'm Celia. I'm a mathematician by training. I'm currently a senior lecturer at King's College London. Uh, what I do is psychometrics, essentially uh, statistics that are uh, applied in psychology and mental health sciences, not as fancy as <laughs> uh, Jane stuff. Um, I also work on misophonia. This is one of my projects, but obviously my favorite project, A, because I work with Jane, and B, because I experience misophonia myself. So I find this uh, whole field very fascinating. Awesome. Thank you so much. I dropped a couple of links to more information about our presenters in the chat, if you want to see those. And well, all right, we'll go ahead. In the chat, sorry, before we get, I want to hear who's here with us as well. So I right. posted in the chat um, a link to do a quick poll to, just to find out what brought you here to this talk today. So we can just hear who you are. Yeah, it's that's the, the very um, first can, link. Yes, yeah, the, the very, very first link. link. Sorry, I kind of upstaged yeah. your link there. But yeah, the first link, the vivox.app one is Dr. Gregory's. And okay. if you I'm going to share mind. my screen on that because that will ever, then everyone can see the results as well. Yeah. So I'll just do that. Okay. Is everyone seeing the right thing there? It's happening. There we go. Yep. Great. Now, it's not showing the results. How do I get it to update the results then? Just try filling it out. Show sure results. There we go. So it looks like lots of people with personal experience of misophonia, not surprising. I was just saying to Chris before we started that actually we think that the the main people who read our research at the moment are people with misophonia because everyone is stuck trying to figure this out on their own at the moment because so many clinicians and family members don't really understand the problem. Mm -hmm. so not surprising that that's who's come here today. But it looks like Absolutely. we've also got some researchers and some family members, which is great. Well done you for supporting your family members and audiology as well. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Luckily, nobody here by accident yet. <laughs> All right, I like this real-time okay. leaderboard of who's who's answering what. All right, I'll stop sharing that and come back. Thanks, okay. everyone. That's really great to see. Who's I know you have a, a few slides to present. Do you want to go ahead and start out with both of those, and then I'll lead into the questions that I have prepared and see what kind of random ramifications come from that? Okay, I think, yes, yeah, starting with the slides would okay. be a good introduction to what we are going to discuss. So that might be helpful. Um, because this is a discussion that is initiated, uh, it's not the only thing we're going to talk about, but the, the main thing is the S5, which is um, uh, a scale about, uh, we created J9 and our uh, research group created about uh, the severity and the experience of misophonia, um, which is a psychometric tool. And I thought for many people, the term psychometrics might be a mystery. I thought it would be a good idea uh, to explain to you uh, what is psychometrics, what actually, uh, we, how actually we create this kind of scales that you might have seen, sometimes you might have participated. So, so let's start with these slides. Jane, do you think this is the correct order, starting with the what is psychometric slides? Um, ho hopefully people won't just go away. I, I think it's not too boring. It's not, uh, not, not, yeah, not statistics in it, I promise. Okay, I'm uh, curious so, to know about it. <laughs> I'm going to try to share now. I'm not very familiar with um, uh, Google presenting, but I think I can do it. Uh, okay, let's hope this will work. If not, I'll try again. Okay, um, are you seeing my slides? We got it, yeah. Okay, so psychometrics. Uh, I'm going to 
talk to you about the key ideas in psychometrics. Um, let's start with the word psychometrics, just like misophonia. Psychometrics is made by two Greek words. One means measuring, that's metrics, and the other psyche means uh, one's soul. So essentially, psychometrics is the art of measuring one's uh, measurements with regard to one's soul, which is quite fancy. But what it actually means in psychology and psychiatry, psychometrics is the field of study concerned with what they call psychological assessment, understanding what is happening uh, to people. But in statistics, and myself, I'm a statistician, when I hear the term psychometrics, what I understand is this field of statistics that has to do with very advanced statistical modeling that deals with the so-called latent variables. What is latent variables? These are variables that cannot be directly observed. Uh, let's see some examples. In social sciences and in uh, education, actually, uh, we often need to measure stuff like um, emotions, people's emotions, uh, beliefs, attitudes, uh, personality traits, knowledge in education uh, most often. Uh, perception, all those things is not like your height and your weight. It's difficult um, to observe directly. You cannot observe them, measure them directly. That's why we call them the latent variables. So uh, what do we do? Uh, the idea is, in order to measure the unobserved latent variable, we use people's responses in what we call the observed items, our questions. The items are just questions we ask people with uh, the goal of measuring and understanding the latent variable. So the idea dates back to Galton. Um, Galton was Darwin's cousin, and when Darwin um, published The Origin of Species, um, Galton got very inspired or a little bit jealous, I don't know. So he tried to think in the similar way, and actually he came up with a very brilliant idea, a very simple one that we all know now, but back then wasn't that clear. Uh, so he said two variable organs, because the term variable wasn't wasn't there yet, and the term organs comes from the uh, origin of species. Two variable organs are correlated, again, the term correlation wasn't a thing back then, uh, they are correlated when the variation of one comes with more or less the variation of another one in the same direction. So what did Galton say? What was the, the, the point behind it? He said, wait a minute, if two things change towards the same direction, there must be a common cause that is causing this change. And that's the basic idea of psychometrics. He said the common cause, the latent variable, affects what do you respond to my questions? So, for instance, is your aggression that affects how, what you respond to my questions on whether, for instance, when I get angry, I bang the door or I break stuff. So what do I do uh, in research or in, even in, in clinical practice? What I do, I reverse the order. I use your re responses and their variation and covariation, and we will see what that is to measure the latent, the common cause. What caused you to give me these answers? Now, what is variation and covariation? Because this too is everything in, uh, in statistics, and this too is everything in psychometrics in particular. Variation, we call something variation, we have the variability as a term in statistics, is that, that thing that when I ask you something, not everybody in the planet is going to give me the same answer. If everybody in the planet is going to give me the same answer, there is no variability there, there is no variation, I have absolutely no reason to, run, uh, to do any kind of uh, statistics in it. But often people, especially when it comes to latent variables, people don't give you the exact same answer in your questions. Covariation is what we said before that, uh, that uh, Galton said, when things change, but not only they change, they don't change randomly, they change towards the same direction. And let's see what that means. How are we going to do this? Um, we're going to do that by using fly flowers. I hope you like flowers. So I want you to pretend that the questions of a questioner of a psychometric scale are just flowers. So all of us are sitting in our uh, living room, in a lovely living room, and we're looking out of a window. And uh, the, the window is closed, and that's all we see. That's all we observe. So the uh, flowers you see here, it's an every flower, is uh, the questions in the questionnaire, which we call the items. So none of us can feel the wind. Uh, none of us can hear the wind. But all of us realize 
wait a minute, there is wind. Not only we see the wind, we understand there is wind, and we understand that because of the movement of the flowers, the way they all move towards the same direction, as Galton said. Not only we realize the existence of the latent variables, which here is the wind, but we can say when it blows, when it not, which direction it blows, and how strong it is simply by the manifestation that happens on the flowers. That's exactly what I see in my output after I run the analysis. We, there is this table that's called the loadings matrix, whereas when I look at it, I can see the effect of the wind, which the wind is um, the, uh, common, uh, the, the, the common cause, the latent variable. So that's exactly what the covariation is. Of course, we don't uh, forget in our research that, okay, all flowers, yeah, they're moving towards the same direction because there is the wind, but it's and every flower is slightly different. And if you look closer, you will see that the movement is not exactly the same for every flower. And this is the same case, uh, the same thing happens in psychometrics. Uh, here you can see the flowers, they are moving slightly different and that might be due to their size or how many flowers there are around them or whether they are, the petals are closed or open. Uh, so in psychometrics we say, okay, we have the common cause of movement, but there are also specific uh, factors that affect uh, the variation of a question. So the common cause might be in a questionnaire for misophonia, it could be um, your sensitivity to sounds. Okay, but there are other things that make you answer a question in a certain way, right? Like things you like, things you don't like, your culture, um, how tired you were that day. We do take all those things under consideration. We do model around those things, but we can still isolate the common cause uh, using the uh, advanced statistical modeling. No matter how advanced the statistical models are, the ideas is, are as simple as you see right now in your screen. The next thing I would like to talk to you about is that sometimes, um, in most times actually, we don't only have one common cause, it might be in the same um, uh, umbrella, but uh, in the same group of causes, but often we have multiple causes, and we call this multi-dimensional scales or multi-factors. So some questions come with different factors. For instance, here we see again out of our window, we see flowers, but these flowers are affected by the sun. Whereas the wildflowers we were looking before might not be affected by the sun. And these flowers are less affected by the wind because they're bigger and wind actually doesn't do much to them, uh, but it did a lot to the wildflowers. Um, these are called the different dimensions within the questionnaire and in a similar way you can see the effect in the flowers, you can see the effect in the questions in the questionnaire in your output. So that's what we did with the S5, uh, Selective Sound Sensitivity Syndrome Scale. So many S's, sorry for that, uh, the S5. Um, we um, gave those questions to people. We started with people who self-identify with misophonia. We found them online. Uh, at some point, with Jane's help, um, we actually asked people about uh, 85 of those questions. And... Um, we ran statistical analysis over the course of three years and about 3,000 people participated. Some people participated a couple of times. And we end up with the best 25 items. These 25 items were the best flowers. These were the flowers that actually were moving where the wind misophonia was blowing. That's, that's what, what we did. And uh, not only that, when we uh, went on with our analysis, we realized that not only all these, yes, all of them, all of them uh, reflect sound sensitivities, but actually what they did, and we saw that in our models, they actually created uh, subgroups. And it turned out that was uh, there were five groups of five questions each in a scale that's called S5, and that was, I promise you, a complete coincidence. It's not what we did, but it was highly, highly satisfying. So, and here comes the best part. Um, is this is the most creative part of uh, the psychometrics procedure. Uh, often I am the lay person in uh, this part. Uh, the, the expert comes here, it was Jane Gregory, who actually created most of the items, and she would read very carefully these groups and she would try to understand what kind of wind affected this particular set of flowers. So what was uh, making people answer towards the same direction 
this set of items in um, in the green in the green uh, group. So the very first one was the externalizing appraisals. It's your fault that I react this way. Um, certain sounds are just bad manners. People shouldn't do it. Um, I feel very strongly. I have this emotional response to sounds because I can't stand how selfish people are. On the contrary, there was another set of items that people um, answered in a similar manner that said, you know what, it's my fault that I react this way. The internalizing appraisals, uh, I feel that I must be an angry person, or I dislike myself due to my reactions, or um, some people, some reactions I have to certain sounds make me feel that deep inside something is wrong. Another set was the impact. People, people's worries about the sound sensitivities and the reaction they have to the sensitivities. My job opportunities will be uh, limited, I don't meet friends, eventually I will end up alone, that kind of uh, questions, statements. Uh, then we had outbursts, the fears people have that they might act uh, in an aggressive manner or sometimes they actually act in an aggressive manner. I can get so angry that I get physical, uh, physically aggressive or I'm afraid I'm going to be physically aggressive. And the last one was the sense of the emotional threat, a very important factor. It and down, Jane will tell you all about that. Uh, these are statements like, I feel trapped if I cannot get away from certain noises. I can experience distress as the result of the same noises. noises. So we came up with these five factors. The next step, was to reapply the same questions to many different um, samples. Actually, we had an English-speaking population first with people who identified with misophonia. Then we had a representative sample of the UK population. And then we started translating the scale um, with the help of uh, people around the world who were interested in misophonia, researchers. And so far, we have... Um, tested in all those languages with you see in your screen. And guess what? The same five factors came up. Exactly the same. And that is, this is very, this is a very fortunate thing for us because now that we have a tool that we can actually use uh, internationally, we can study um, uh, in misophonia in an in international way, cross-cultural way. Uh, currently, we are translating the questionnaire in six more languages, and if some of you are researchers, because some of you said you are researchers or experts in misophonia, if you would like to collaborate with us in translating the S5 in another language, please um, let us know. I hope that wasn't too boring and gave you an idea of how psychometrics work. That's all I have to tell you at this point, to introduce you to what we do, why we do it, and most import importantly, why it actually works, because it does work. And we saw it even globally. Awesome. Thanks so much. That was uh, actually pretty informative. I'm going to drop a link in the chat that is to the study itself. This is, I believe this is the first, but one of the first of many uh, papers that have come out about the S5 uh, recently. And this is sort of the instigation of of the S5 itself. Um, Dr. Greg, did you want to share your slides? And then we'll kind of s sum all this up and ask questions. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to say, like, one of the reasons that I, I, I tracked Celia down when she was literally nine months pregnant to ask if I could work with her. And the reason I did that is because I had started seeing patients with misophonia at our clinic. We was, it was still quite experimental we were trying to figure out how to help people with misophonia to bring down the intensity of the reaction and the question is that we had at the time a lot of them were about how do you uh, how sensitive you are to sounds compared to other people and what you do in reaction to the sound so either how you feel or what you do like avoid or block sounds things like that and what we were finding is that people in therapy was saying this is really helping my misophonia feels a lot better but it's not captured in the question so i still feel like so there's the few questions that are like compared to other people are you more sensitive to the sound of eating and chewing are you more sensitive to the sound of breathing and they said yes compared to other people i still am but compared to where i started my intensity has gone from here down to here and i no longer feel trapped or helpless or like I'm going to have a panic attack when I'm um, around 
sounds. So I basically tracked Celia down. She was literally about to give birth. And I was like, please, can we work together? Because we need something that captures what are the what makes misophonia so bad for some people that they might need help for their misophonia and that we might be able to help with those aspects in therapy so i wanted to include those parts of the problem that actually could potentially change with therapy so um what i want to just do is quickly show you oh in fact let's just do another quick poll so for those who a new there's um, in the chat there's a, a link to a poll and i'm just going to put it on the screen now as well there's a new poll open uh tab. okay so if you just click on that link and we'll just see what everyone has to say what what what's your feeling when you hear someone chewing loudly or eating with their mouth open yeah, the link is in chat. So here we go. There's also a QR code. If you've got your phone on you, you can just scan the code that's on the screen now. Wow. So the, watching this emerge, and I always get so excited to see this happen because one of the things that Celia and I have fought for is to say that we think that anxiety and panic are huge parts of the misophonia experience that not everyone experiences it but also not everyone experiences the, the classic anger and rage that gets reported and i'm seeing that quite a few people have put um anxious there's a, a the size of the word panic's grown a little bit as well so it's not just anger mm -hmm. and this was really important to us because anxiety is something that is much easier to treat than anger so if we can target the anxiety first for the people that that applies to then that might actually help to bring the reaction down in general and then that might make it easier if there is still anger there that we can work on the anger because there's it's not sort of clouded by the anxiety so it looks like most people have done that now so i'm just going to switch back to me but thank you for, for doing that um so what i'm going to do now is just show you what we we collected we asked the same people we asked that same question to a huge group of um, eight over 800 people who said they had misophonia and another group of more than 700 people um, who were representative of the general population in the uk so that just means that in terms of age and gender and ethnicity that this was representative of what the population of the uk looks like and I'm just going to show you because one of the reason we ask this question is because one of the things when I talk about misophonia is people always say, oh, everyone hates the sound of eating with your mouth open. Nobody likes that sound. And I wanted to know the answer to that question. Is that true that nobody likes that sound? So I'm just going to show you the results. Let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger. There we go. I hope everyone can see that. So it's true. Actually, most people don't like the sound of loud eating. There was only 15% of people in the general population who said that they didn't like the sound of loud eating, that they had no feeling to the sound of loud eating. Most people said a negative emotion. But if you have a look at the difference between the general population and the misophonia population, it was irritation and disgust were the main reactions in the general population and anger and panic were the main reactions in the misophonia population. So there's a real difference in the nature of the reaction. So that's part of it is that it's not just, um, it's not, yeah, it's not just that people don't like it. It's that there's the actual emotion that you experience is different for people with misophonia. And then as Celia was talking about what we, what we realized when we looked into it, in a statistical way we discovered all of those different um aspects that make up misophonia and we think that this is kind of at the core of misophonia where it gets to a really severe it's been categorized now as a disorder and so we think that this might be part of the disorder of misophonia is when you experience these aspects of misophonia as well so this is from the misophonia group each um of those those five areas that celia mentioned they're scored out of 50 
And if you have a look at the threat one, that's I feel trapped, helpless, panic, like I'm going to explode if I can't get away from sounds. That's around 45 out of 50, which means that for those five items, people said nine out of 10. Yes, to those items. So that was the that seems to be like the main defining characteristic of misophonia. And then we've got that externalizing, the internalizing, which is a little bit lower than externalizing impact and outburst. And as you see, actually outbursts are not a key feature of misophonia, although we're, we're interested to see how that looks in children because we think that maybe it might be a bit harder for, for children to regulate or, or control those impulses. And then if we have a look comparing that to the general population, we've got um, actually that that's only 50% higher from the misophonia population to the from the general population. So actually it's pretty normal to blame other people for making disgusting noises. The real difference is in these other four factors that are all three or four times higher in the misophonia population than in the general population. So you can really see that misophonia is not just about how you react to sounds, it's how, how you feel about how you react to sounds. It's the impact that it has on you, what you perceive are the limitations of having these reactions to sounds and um, worrying about the sort of outbursts that you might have. And one of the things that we noticed that didn't, all the, the flowers that flew away in the wind and so weren't part of what could tell us what direction the wind went, were things about what people did, blocking their ears, putting headphones on. And we realized that that's because you can't use that very well to measure the severity of misophonia because some people use that um, and their misophonia is really low because they have those strategies. So sometimes those are really helpful, healthy coping strategies that keep their level of misophonia low. So it's not a good marker of whether someone has misophonia or not. Um, so we are now looking at measuring those things separately from all of all of these the five aspects that we think are sort of at the core of measuring the severity of misophonia. So we have now talked for ages, so I'm gonna um, unpin myself and um, give the mic back to Chris because I know he had some questions as well. No, that's, that's just not, an overview of what we've been working on. That's a great introduction actually and I had a lot of thoughts about it. Um, I guess internalization was a big part of I'm old, I'm 48. And so I started experiencing this, you know, uh, many years before it was a recognized condition or anything. And I always thought there was something wrong with me because nobody else was as bothered by those sounds. So it's nice to see that there's those dis different aspects of how people react to it. Uh, so we started out, you wanted a more dynamic, a more comprehensive assessment method for misophonia that didn't just include how people react to sounds because there's some flaws in that. When we're looking at the landscape of misophonia, there's a lot of work being done on trying to get diagnostic criteria published or agreed upon or proposed and agreed upon and discussed at the scientific level. How does having this particular assessment, the S5, does lead us closer to getting consensus diagnostic criteria? Where are we with that? So I think one of the things that that the, the consensus definition that came out recently, so Chris is talking about a paper that came out where a huge panel of experts came together to decide how we should define misophonia. It's a really important step in legitimizing it as um, what they, they labeled it as a disorder. But one of the problems with it is that it came out at a point where misophonia research was just starting to spike. And so a lot of the newest research tells us a lot more about misophonia and that wasn't included in the evaluation to, to define it. So the next step really will be thinking about how do we diagnose misophonia. And one of the problems has been that people, everyone diagnoses it based on the misophonia that they have experienced, either personally or with, with patients that they work with or research that they've done. And we're at a real risk of diagnosing, of setting that criteria too early, because if we only base it on what we think it is, then um, we will then start to diagnose people based on that and then we might miss a whole lot of other people. And that, a really good example of that happening in a really bad way is with autism, that the diagnostic criteria for autism for a long time was based on observations of boys and usually white boys. And autism presents in so many different ways, particularly differently um, in women and um, in people of colour. It, it's a really different experience of autism. But what happened was once we started defining autism in that way, that's who was included in the research. So it just made the problem 
grow and it separated people from um, accessing the help that they needed. So I'm worried that that will happen with misophonia as well, because I think that there's so many different ways that it can show up. And as we found, like there's these five key factors and some people score sky high on internalizing and zero on externalizing. And other people are like, nope, this is all your fault. Um, it's nothing to do with me. And for those people, it's part of therapy is like learning to take some um, ownership of the, of the problem and recognizing that you're not in control of other people and therefore you have to accept part of the, the problem is within you and not that it's your fault but that you have a responsibility to to figure out what to do with that that unfortunately we can't control the people around us as much as we would like to be able to um so one of the things that we think our research is contributing is that aspect of the internalizing that that's really really important and that aspect of feeling trapped and helpless that that's one of the um like that it, it scores so high in most people with misophonia and is so characteristic that we think that 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 idea of feeling sort of out of control or um, unable to like contain your emotions might be part of the diagnostic criteria but also recognizing that that's not everyone's experience so that the criteria have to be flexible and the other thing for us was that finding about um, anxiety and panic being a key reaction because one of the research groups that were really fundamental in the early misophonia research declared that anxiety wasn't a primary reaction and therefore only recruited people who had anger or disgust as their main reaction and therefore all of their work looked like that's all it was um, and didn't even get a chance give people a chance to select anxiety as their main response because their questionnaire said anger disgust irritation or other so unless you thought oh yes other i'm going to choose another word it's much easier to just pick something that you recognize than it is to think of something that you have to name yourself and, and add into the box and if you don't see your reaction there it also can be quite isolating because it feels like nobody else feels this way otherwise they would have it on the list so ours shows that i think it was 22 or 23 percent of people with misophonia when it comes to loud chewing and chewing gum they say panic is their main reaction so that needs to be part of the awareness of, of what people's experience with misophonia can be yeah uh, and, um if i may um it uh one of the reasons we we it took us so, so long it took us three years oh my god working on this scale was exactly what jane says now we uh talk a lot with uh, the misosphere as you called it i like this expression <laughs> very much uh we got people's feedback uh we had uh, panels we have uh, people who would advise us ourselves have experience of the uh, of misophonic uh, we have the misophonic experience but most importantly um when you talk about the criteria and finding it as, as a disorder of course in, in research we are always flexible we say that's what we think right now yeah but we keep challenge ourselves okay and that will go on and on and on and on but uh, learning from previous mistakes as jane uh said we now know some things we know for instance that is very useful to have a tool like the s5 and not only the s5 that is actually tested both in people with misophonia who self-identify with misophonia chances are they have misophonia and general population and it works the same they might have different scores but it works the same therefore by using this feature that this tool works well for everyone i can see what actually gives the one click up that actually is the misophonia or even misophonia as a disorder not as a characteristic um we call these severity scales but there are also different tools we have the screening scales where we're trying to find out who actually has a, a high elevated probability of having a disorder and then we have the diagnostic tools and uh, currently um, you might have observed that there is a spike in uh, research in misophonia um, because it's becoming known and researchers are fascinated by it and uh, at the end um, thankfully they listen to people with misophonia but also because funding comes our way because as researchers if we don't have funding it's very hard to work and there is funding coming mainly from the US and they're currently trying to fund specifically the creation of uh, measurement tools 
but different measurement tools. One could be a diagnostic tool. The other could be a diagnostic interview. The other is a severity scale. The next one is when we have all those tools, it's like having different brushes and having your canvas and having your colors. And then you have to use all of them together to try to draw the picture of misophonia. Right now, we haven't we don't have a clear portrait of misophonia, but we're starting to have the tools to be able to create the portrait. And one thing will help the other. There will be contradictions that we will say things and then we'll say, you know, you know what? That wasn't it. Behind it, it was something else. Now we know better. This happens in research, but there's, uh, and that's well accepted. And that's, that's what research is, always trying to find out, the, approximate um, the truth. Uh, but now at least we start, we have a starting point. We have amazing people globally, so many different research centers uh, uh, trying to figure out uh, misophonia. They have created other tools. And if you see, the tools are so different. They might all have the same name, like uh, that for misophonia, MisoQuest or misophonia scale or a -miso, something like that, or S5. But if you actually read the items, they come from different logics. Sometimes this is because people have different backgrounds. So I was a psychometrician. I had a very clear model of how psychometrics work. Jane Gregory is a person who acknowledges and knows very deeply what misophonia is, but she's also a research, a clinical psychologist. We have a certain way of thinking as to. We came together, we created the S5 along with the other people of our team. Other people from different places, different universities, they have a different way of look, looking towards misophonia. And we want that. We want the polyphony, right? Eventually, all this evidence from around the world, different types of thinking, will start converging. And uh, hopefully, soon enough, we will know. My, if I may risk a prediction, I think there are types of misophonia. I don't think there is one thing. I think they are subtypes. And now that we have measurement tools, we will be able to do even more advanced statistical models that will show clearly, again, by winds blowing towards the subtypes, that they are very different subtypes, but they're all under the same cluster. So let's see. What, uh, I think the next five years are very important. And what we will know in five years' time, we cannot even imagine today. So there is lots of hope for misophonia right now. Absolutely. And when I think back on what's happened just in the last five years, we, you were talking about some of the different scales. And one of the original, more widely used scales was the Amsterdam scale. And that was based off of a previously existing OCD scale when it was considered maybe a type of OCD. And so as we learn these things every few months, every few years, things have to change to shift. And we know a lot more about it since then, even though that was quite, quite widely used. We do have a question actually uh, from I Heather Hansen. Say, what, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I'm just, sorry. And I've seen Heather's question. Hi, Heather. Heather and I met at the Misophonia Convention last year. Um, just on that, that, that also we we feel the same way about our questionnaire. We don't think this is the final version. We think that this is what we can use now. And statistically, it's great. Like, it, it, Cilia, Cilia tells me it's a work of art. But it's based on what we know now and there's so much more to learn so we expect it to be a flexible tool, tool that will grow with misophonia research and we're doing some extra little bits now that sort of add to that as well but yes heather has asked a question which Celia can answer um which is about using the s5 in research and whether it's just a severity scale or do we have a cutoff for whether someone has or doesn't have misophonia so uh, what we did, Heather, we um, administered the uh, S5 in a representative sample of the UK population. That was the one thing we did. The second thing we did, we invited those people, some of those people, and then Jane and Tom, Graham Tom, uh, they uh, went through an interview with uh, these people. Like um, it could take up to uh, 20 minutes, I think, uh, Jane, or half an hour. So uh, Sometimes longer because it was the first time anyone had had a chance to talk about the misophonia. So sometimes it took an hour, but most of the time it was 15, <laughs> 20 minutes. <laughs> so these two experts, they both uh, had the uh, misophonia clinic, the only misophonia clinic in London at the Mosley Hospital. So these people, uh, Jane and Tom, uh, being experts, were able to say, look, this person has a misophonia. This person has a misophonia of clinical interest, like really, really difficult stuff here, okay? And this person does not have misophonia. Then, these people, all, we also had their um, scores in uh, the questionnaire. So what we did, we used this, the people who we knew confirmed 
by a, a clinician that they are more likely to have a significant misophonia. What were the average score? And what was the average score for people who don't have misophonia? And that, that, then using techniques such as the rockers, as we call them, and other techniques, statistical modeling, we estimated a threshold for the S5 where one, if one scores above that uh, threshold, most likely they have significant misophonia experiences. It makes sense if you answer 10, 10, 10 to all those questions, right, that reflect sound sensitivity, uh, of course, it's, you are more likely to have misophonia. But we, are, we were able to have this cutoff point. Now, as, as uh, Jane said, this is work in progress. This paper is about to be published, hopefully. It's already available. Everything we do, we put it online. We do open access uh, science. We make sure that, or because we invite the community to help us creating those tools, we make sure they're available to everyone. I think Chris. Uh, I, I don't know, Chris, if you had put the um, the UK population, uh, it's a, it's a, a preprint or uh, available online. Uh, we can post it later in the um, uh, in the chat. Ready. Yeah. So you can see the exact number. You can see the differences and everything. However, if our research later on uh, tells us, look. We now use this uh, semi-structured interview, and we defined who has the, our way of telling who has misophonia or not. And then we redid the analysis. Maybe this cutoff is slightly shift. I don't think the shift will be too much. Uh, or we can add another scale in the S5, another subscale. Then things will change. But currently, we have yes, we do have a way using the S5 uh, to say whether you are more likely or less likely to have misophonia of a clinical interest. Um, psychometrics, however, as uh, all statistics, is a matter of probability. You will never hear me saying you do have misophonia or you don't have misophonia. You'll always using those tools. You can only say you are more likely to have, less likely to have. If we want to confirm that then you would need to have an interview with a clinician uh, that will actually uh, have the um, diagnostic criteria when we get to that point and say, yes, I confirm. So we are on our way. We have done huge steps, but there are steps to be done to, to, be, fully, uh, to be fully clear how to identify misophonia. But yes, uh, the S5 can be used as an indicator, but not as the diagnostic tool per se. And okay. for that paper that's out, we've um, we've classified it as a significant burden, um, a misophonia to a significant burden level, because that was before the um, the consensus definition paper came out defining it as a disorder. So we asked people, how much does this affect your life, and how much of a burden is it for you? And if if, if together the clinician and the um, person being interviewed felt like it was a significant burden, then they would say go into the yes misophonia category. But what we've done since then, since that paper come out, came out, is we've redefined it as in the um, diagnostic criteria that we've been using, if it has a significant impact to the level that we would consider suitable for, say, accessing therapy services, what we would call like clinical misophonia, that it's probably a disorder level misophonia. We say clinical misophonia, if they have misophonia but not that significant impact or distress on an ongoing basis we would say subclinical misophonia which means you still have it but it's not at what we would consider to be a disorder level and so we're going to do the analysis again so we'll probably have some new scores that will help us to um, estimate yes someone's more likely to have clinical misophonia which we think will be higher than the existing cutoff that helps me understand it a lot too, because it it is a a gradient. It's not a cut necessarily a cutoff thing per se. Although you have to do that at some point, where you can say these people have a, a very pronounced version that debilitates their life. There's some people who have it, but they can kind of cope with it and manage it. So uh, somewhere along that spectrum, there's different levels, I guess. Yeah. Um, have a yeah, couple and the only way that that's helpful is maybe in research where you need to cut group people into yes, they probably have it or no, they probably don't have it at a individual level it, it's more about the individual experience okay uh, a couple of questions have come in one from mary petrie uh, she says what happens to uh, psychological assessment tools for misophonia if the condition's etiology turns out to be related to synesthesia asmr tinnitus etc uh, i think uh, i've seen just one assessment for decreased sound tolerance built around it can these assessment tools work together how will one prevail i also 
uh, ask this, understanding that no matter what misophonia origin and mechanics, there are psychological components to the condition. And we're learning about that complexity uh, a lot. I don't know how you how you want to respond to that, but it, my understanding is that misophonia co-occurs with a wide spectrum of common we'll call mental health or emotional health conditions. One of those doesn't necessarily stick out, but it does co-occur very frequently, and we're not quite sure how that works out. How do you how do you respond? We could, I think that it can only emerge with time. It's really hard to say at this stage. And we have the same problem at the moment with trying to measure synesthesia and ASMR because they are also relatively newly recognised and we that, that process that Celia was talking about, about identifying the latent variable, it's really hard to measure because you're, you're trying to capture in words an experience that is actually only felt. So... It, we I, yeah we don't know yet basically how things will change as we learn more about it I yes don't know we, we don't know yet that. mary uh but we do have it's a, it's a common problem mary what you describe is a common problem in psychometrics no matter what you're trying to measure it's always a problem and we call this the assessment of validity okay so we have ways and definitions on how to see when i'm saying i'm measuring misophonia am i measuring misophonia or am i measuring hyperacusis yeah, am I measuring misophonia or am I measuring anxiety? But we do have models that can help us separate that. Now, based on our published research, some things uh, we have seen we have seen some correlations. Like there's a little bit of anxiety going with misophonia. There's a little bit of um, elevated number um, um, frequencies in that co-occurring diagnosis. But so far, we have seen and other researchers have seen that misophonia is a standalone thing so far okay as we go on with research we might see something different yes some mechanisms might be common but not that common so there are some components that overlap but some components so they still it uh, based on what we've seen so far it's still a standalone thing so far mary but as uh, methodologically speaking speaking our psychometricians have very clear rules and definitions on testing the psychometric properties of a scale, as we say, and one of them, the most important, is called validity, and it's exactly what Mary describes in her question, and it's never ending. Uh, so you cannot prove validity. Validity is something you go after uh, for years and years and uh, ages as research goes on. But we do, we do do our best to to make this to answer these questions. Thank you so um, much. I've noticed. Sorry, th there's, there's two questions. Brian, I want to acknowledge that you have had, had your hand up for ages. <laughs> Medication question I will come back to, but Priyanka's question in the chat there fits a little bit with the diagnostic stuff we were just talking about. So I just want to quickly answer that first, and then we can come back to the medication question, um, which is also a really interesting question. So, um, with, so Priyanka in the chat has asked, does the diagnosis of misophonia also require the identification of specific sounds since the management may require desensitization through similar simulated sounds, especially when it coexists with tinnitus. So firstly, um, I just wanted to quickly say that um, I don't necessarily agree with the premise of desensitization. I don't think that the, the treatment for misophonia is about getting used to sounds or habituating to sounds. And, and if anything, actually some people sensitized to sounds not desensitized to sounds so they don't get used to them so what we're working on is is trying to create new associations with sounds and sometimes that it, we we definitely use sounds as part of the therapy but not like you have to sit here and get used to it it's like we might play it for 10 seconds and we'll try different things while the sound is playing and see if it helps to create a new association with sound because we think that the collect collective experiences over time has intensified the reaction to sounds. And if we can create new experiences, sometimes that can bring down the intensity. But first, we would be working on all that other stuff that makes it worse. Blaming yourself, um, feeling like you can't have a life with misophonia, um, worrying about um, acting out on your thoughts, that kind of thing. So that part first is just about the, the treatment, which I think is yeah there's there are definitely different opinions on that but that's my personal current approach to it um but in terms of the diagnostic criteria so within the current definition it's basically related to the nature of the sounds not the specific exact sound so while there's a lot of overlap in what the sounds are the most important thing is that it's not based on the volume of the sound if it's based on the volume of the sound only and you get the same reaction if any sounds are over that volume it's more likely to be hyperacusis 
um, with misophonia, it's where the the specific pattern of the sound, so the, either the repetition or the nature of the sound, or what that sound means to you. So who's making it, the context that it's in, what you're trying to do at the time that you're hearing the sound. It could be any sound as long as it fits that sort of general criteria. But yes, in terms of treatment, it's very helpful to know what those sounds are because we would want to think about how often you hear those sounds and, and how we can target um, improving your life because of those specific sounds. But the diagnosis doesn't require that. The diagnosis just requires that it's not volume based and that there's some kind of pattern or meaning to the sounds at the moment again we it, it might change over time um should i come back to brian's very very patient question on yeah if meditation? you don't mind it is a good question that gets asked a lot in, in, yes. in the mesosphere yeah and there's, there's not a lot of research on it there's um there um, i think mary has very kindly posted a link in the chat to a study using beta blockers but basically what i'm observing clinically and in a lot of the research is that it can express itself in so many different ways for people that i'm not a medical um practitioner i i'm not qualified to say this but um the nature and how it presents itself might impact the decisions that you make about prescription so for some people they spend a lot of time in between sounds dwelling on it thinking about how miserable they are having this problem worrying about what's going to happen in the future and so that starts to look a little bit more like a depressive pattern so a classic antidepressant might be the best sort of experimental thing to try there which isn't targeting the misophonia specifically it's targeting the consequence of the misophonia whereas there are other people who are really worried about how they appear to others when they're reacting to sounds which is really similar to social anxiety which is really worrying about appearing nervous or appearing foolish in front of other people and some people their misophonia looks a lot like that so then you might make medication decisions based on what you would do for somebody with social anxiety then there are other people who think that um or well, if they get so um ramped up by the sounds that they might have a heart attack or a stroke or that this will stress them so much that something catastrophic will happen in their body in which case we would be approaching it more like panic disorder so it can come out in so many different ways and so the medication decisions can only be made at the moment on an individual basis there's nothing that we know to target misophonia specifically i hope that helped that was very helpful actually thank you and one of the things that i hear to kind of wrap up we're at a point in the misophonia research where it's like the i don't know if there's a better term for this but the blind man zoo story where a psychologist is looking at this complicated problem and sees it as a psychological disorder and a neurobiologist is looking at this problem and seeing it as a neurobiological disorder and so on and so on. And so we're all looking at this very complicated, this phony is a very complicated disorder. It's not just a hearing disorder, an audiological disorder, um, like a lot of things like ADHD or like addiction. They're very complicated. You can come at them from many different angles correctly. So that remains to be seen, I suppose, but having all of those people looking at it from a different viewpoint Will ultimately, I think, be beneficial. Um, the quick answer is listen to the statistician. <laughs> <laughs> we we see only numbers. We only see how things how the wind blows uh, towards the flowers. So, but yeah, looking things from different angles is the best thing that can happen. And I'm so excited that all these people from different starting points have now interest in misophonia because that's the way to find what's going on and how to treat people who suffer from the condition the disorder yeah Absolutely. and it just looks so different in so many people and so like i i come at it from a psychological perspective because those are the people who have found me and who've shown up at our, our clinic but if the things that i talk about in terms of the therapy don't apply to you then it's it's, it's not for you that's okay like there's so many different ways that this shows up and lots of the things we've talked about will can, people will connect with and some people will be just going that's not my experience at all in which case a psychological approach is probably not going to be hugely helpful at least not at this stage i don't think this is a psychological problem but i think that there are huge psychological consequences and i think there are psychological or um learned uh, not learned um exp our experiences and how people respond to us when we're reacting makes a huge difference in terms of how we react later in life you know if, if you someone with um dyslexia didn't know they had dyslexia as a kid they're gonna feel stupid a lot of the time <laughs> because they didn't have an explanation for why they couldn't do things at the same pace as other people why they struggled and as an adult even if they get a diagnosis they might still feel stupid because that's 
what their experience was growing up. And I think it's the same with misophonia. And those are the parts that we can help with therapy. If, if, that, if you connect with that idea, that's the bit that therapy can help with. Excellent point. Way to summarize that. And, you know, with my background in the arts, I see the misosphere and I see a lot of creative people. So from my vantage point, I go, these people are all very artistic. I wonder why that is. Um, in summary. Uh, yeah, we, because they don't ignore important information. Like, right. That could be important. important. Sensory I'm not going to ignore it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's really can't, important for creativity. Can't help but notice it. A lot of musicians out there. Uh, one quick question uh, from Mary, and then we'll wrap up and summarize everything. Uh, Mary uh, also followed up, which I think is a good segue into discussing your other study on outbursts and you know social isolation and, and the re results of that. She's saying, speaking of numbers, how can one speak of the outburst category generally? When one trait is fear of an outburst and the other trait measures the experience of the outburst itself, if we have time, but you all have a paper on that that sort of follows that. And I can I can post the link to that if you want to answer it too. Yeah, so it, it, Mary, that's an excellent question. And we basically picked the word, we were trying to find single word things so that when people are using this questionnaire in research, they can just use one word to capture that factor. But but really what we should what what we should be saying there is um outbursts and fear of outbursts because that is what that captures and actually the fear of having outbursts is much higher but we also don't know if the fear of outbursts is higher because people have had outbursts and so they that they're scoring a little bit higher on actually having outbursts but more on fearing but we don't know which order that we don't know what direction that goes in um so yeah so we don't we're not talking about that as being actual outbursts we're saying it could be actual outbursts it could be fear of having outbursts and one of the things that we're working on at the moment is a separate little scale that goes alongside the s5 which is feared consequences which is what you are afraid will happen because of your misophonia and that's split into two categories thanks to Celia and her colleagues amazing analysis so we found that there's two categories of feared consequences one is social consequences, which is either I'll be judged or someone will be offended by the way I react or it will put me in social danger in some way. And the other is personal consequences. I'll um, get so stressed by this, I'll have a stroke or a heart attack. I'll um, act on the thoughts that are, or images that are in my head. I might sort of suddenly snap and act on those thoughts. So those are yeah, non-social consequences. So we're, we're hoping to understand all of this a little bit better the more that we go along. But yeah very interesting um, uh, if i may yeah because jane ma mentioned the other people of the team i would just uh want to mention nora uglik marushka and uh, chloe hayes uh the both all developers of vs5 they're not here today but they're also uh in uh, the whole study all those years with us just want to mention the names absolutely all right thank you both we'll go ahead and wrap up here i appreciate you taking some time to uh, in case you missed it, if you came in uh, a little late, uh, both of our guests are in the UK. So it's actually Saturday night there and they have plans uh, understandably for their for their Saturday night. So thank you both for taking some time out of your weekend evening uh, to answer some questions and to share your work on the S5. Uh, I'll send out an email this uh, that'll have the links that we used. And I'll also post this video uh, on YouTube in the next couple of days. If you have any more questions or anything, feel free to reach out to me or Dr. Gregory or Dr. Vitorto, who can answer those as well. And we hope to do this again soon. This has been very informative. Thanks for having us. We love talking about Sophonia. So whenever we have a audience, <laughs> we are delighted to take part. We, we have been talking about the Sophonia all the time. And thank you so much for organizing this. This is so useful and for everyone, uh, our students included. And it has been a true pleasure. Likewise. Yeah, you'll have a good rest of your evening and uh, we'll catch up soon. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.